Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is now 12 noon and we want to welcome you to our 14th actual webinar hosted by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. Uh, my name is Yvonne Lewis and I will be your moderator for today. I am the co-director of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center along with other responsibilities here in the community. I certainly want to thank you all for joining us today. This is a very, very special day in so many ways, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I wanted to just make sure that you, uh, to remind you that this is a partnership. The Healthy Plant Research Coordinating Center is a partnership between strong community members, our University of Michigan at, uh, of Flint and Ann Arbor, as well as Michigan State University, joining together to promote the importance of equitable and inclusive research in our community, but also just to, to for this particular webinar to raise awareness about what's happening uh, in our community, given the local context, even though this is a, we've been in a, a global pandemic situation. For those of you who are joining us by YouTube, we want you to remember that um, you can send us questions by a phone or by an email. You can go to info at healthy flint research coordinating center.org or info at hfrcc.org, or you may call 810-835-2130. Again, that number or text 835-2130 if you have questions that you'd like us to respond to. For those of you that are in the webinar, you may also go to the bottom of your screen or wherever it's located on your particular device, and there's a Q&A opportunity. Please put your questions in. We have a wonderful a group that will be responding to your questions today. We want to acknowledge and appreciate the, the valuable work that's been done by many behind the scenes to make sure that this webinar is successful. And following today's session, there will be a brief survey we'll ask you to complete. Again, our intention is that we bring a Flint connection to what's happening. We are indeed in the midst of some difficult challenges, but we're ex excited that our community is coming together to address that. And one of the most important things about today, and, and you see here, um, for those of you that can't see it, today is a very special day. It is Juneteenth, June 19th. Juneteenth is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States of America. And I know all of us can relate to how important that is today. Uh, dating back to 1865, it was on June 19th that the Union soldiers led by Major General Gordon Granger landed in Galveston, Texas. And with the news that slavery had ended, the slaves that were enslaved still after having been, the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed two and a half years earlier, those individuals that were still enslaved in Galveston, Texas had not gotten that word. But on that day, they received word that slavery had been ended. And of course, you can imagine the different emotions that people were feeling at that point. One was certainly a shock, but the other was jubilation. And so today, that leads us to the festivities that we are going to be a part of. Many of us, hopefully, following this webinar, you'll find a way to be a part of the Juneteenth celebration. There are three events going on today, but we want to speak to this one specifically. The traditional Juneteenth celebration of Flint and Genesee County. It will be held at Max Brandon Park at 3606 DuPont Street, right here in the city of Flint. We're celebrating, this is a celebration of heritage. At one o'clock, the park activities will begin. And then at 2 p.m., there will be a special program. Uh, there will be a, a presentation by the young people who are involved in the Black Lives Matter of Group 4 Flint, Genesee County. That includes Dewan Robinson, Clarissa Shields, who we know is our boxing superstar in the female ranks here in the city of Flint, Roy Stevens and Jill, Jill, Jaleel X. One of the great things about Juneteenth that helped the, the, those who were coming out of slavery at that time is this idea of celebration. So it brought food and festivities. And so you will find in the park vendors, youth presentations, backyard games and more, even voter registration and census sign up. These are so important along with some music. There will be a special tribute to one of our community uh, leaders. She was a fabulous woman who never took personal credit for a lot of things, but behind the scene, 
she made sure that information was shared. And that's our, our dear sister, uh, Mrs. Catherine Blake. And we will also be giving recognition to others who lost their lives as a, as, as a result of COVID-19. Um, Bishop Bernadette Jefferson will be leading that. And then at 4 p.m., the Road to Freedom Motorcade will be led by Mrs. E. Hill Deloney, who's been a community leader in our, for years, as long as I've been in Flint, she's been a community leader. She will lead this motorcade as the marshal. So they're calling for motorcyclists, car clubs, fraternities, sororities, black clubs. You still have time to get in touch with family and friends. If you don't wanna get out of your car and be out in the park, this is one way that you can still get involved in the Juneteenth activities. Now let's remember my brothers and sisters and those of you that are listening to me and I'm calling everybody brother and sister today, we must continue to protect ourselves. This is critically important. I know we're gonna celebrate, but we wanna celebrate by doing those things that are really, really important to our health, well-being, and safety, not just for you, but for the protection of our community. So we wanna remember, continue to wash your hands. I hope we all have hand sanitizers in our pocket. We wanna wear that personal protection equipment. Let's make sure we have our face coverings and be sure that we practice the physical and social distancing necessary to keep us safe. One of the things we talked about so often and, and our previous webinars have done a great job of talking about how we, it's important that we boost our immune systems, that we eat right, that we make sure we're getting some exercise, drinking plenty of water, reducing or, or quitting smoking if you're doing it, reduction in consumption of alcohol, doing those things, eating lots of green fruits, fruit, excuse me, and green vegetables, doing those things that help our bodies be strong. Because one of the things they told us during this pandemic is that right now there is no cure, there is no vaccine. So we have to do the work that helps our bodies be strong to protect us. Let's stay abreast of the information, which is why this webinar today is so important. We're gonna hear from our hospital partners shortly. And ultimately, our goal is to provide you with information so that you can make the best decision in an informative way for yourself, for your family, for your loved ones, friends, and ultimately our community at large. So we wanna to look to that today and get ready, even in the midst of all that's going on, opportunity to celebrate life today and the opportunity for us to be sure that we're doing those things that will make a positive difference in our community. We've been addressing health and health disparities. Dr. Deborah Paul Holden has been one of our key leaders in the community to, to help us with that. So while she is going to be speaking, our panelists, which you've heard from previously and are on with us today, our panelists from across the county, which include, and I won't name them all today, of course, our health department will be back on, but including representatives from the state, from our academic institutions, from community organizations, and our, uh, as well as our health servicing agencies. They are on the line they're on the webinar to answer questions that you might have today. So please, one more time, let me remind you, put those questions in the Q&A and we do our best before the webinar ends today to answer those for you. So let me again, let you know how much we appreciate you being here, how important you will take the messages that you hear today and share them with others in the community. Dr. Deborah, you are on two great task force that have been organized to help look at racial disparities, but also this racial inequity. And that's, that's a conversation that sometimes get lost a little bit and, and collapsed into a, 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 some, some, some discussions, but we want you today to give us some actual additional clarifying information on these two topics. Dr. Deborah. Okay, did I lose Dr. Deborah? Sorry, I was on uh, mute. You were on mute. Yeah. Right? Okay. Thanks. I'm just gonna give a quick. Yeah, I'm just gonna give a quick update on what's happening with the um, governor's task force, and I might throw the ball to good brother Gary Jones if he wants to um, add anything. Um, what I can say is that the uh, initial focus of the task force was really on preventing deaths and reducing disparities, and it included data-driven decision making and transparency. I always remind people, please take with a grain of salt the statistics that you hear about Michigan, because what distinguishes us in the landscape is we were one of the early front runners in not only collecting the kind of data on race and gender and insurance data, status, et cetera, 
but we were also forthcoming and putting that information out and reporting out on that. So the disparities that you see in large part are a function of the fact that we collected that data and we're being transparent about it. We know for a fact that a lot of other states have disparities substantially larger than Michigan and a lot of other places have not been as forthcoming and transparent um, in that process. So that was sort of the initial focus. The two work groups that came out of that, there was a work group focused on testing and then there was another work group focused on um, clinical coordination for uh, COVID patients and people who also had access barriers. So people with ac barriers with access to testing and people who had uh, barriers to um, healthcare. And then we expanded that because there were a lot of people who had quarantine barriers. So even once people were identified, not having the um, kind of living arrangements and, and home life that would be conducive for self-quarantine and protecting themselves and their families. Um, so that work remains ongoing and we stood up a lot of testing sites all across the state. You know, everybody knows they RFP'd and have now rolled out um, a more systemic and, and statewide um, testing protocol. And the thing that I wanted to share to um, this group, uh, with this group is we've also now added a systems focus and there's a new work group that's being stood up within the governor's task force. That's um, the work group is called a center on equity, centering on equity. And the goal with that group is gonna be in addressing implicit bias among healthcare providers and specifically also focusing on maternal um, and child health. And another big push of that group will be integrating equity across systems and systems of care and making sure that equity gets included in a lot of the policy decisions and resource allocations uh, that are happening. I'll stop there. Uh, Brother Gary, anything else you might wanna add to that or did that cut it? <laughs> no, that was perfect. All right, great. Um, and I, I see our host has gone off of- uh, No, I am here. Oh, okay, great, 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 great. <laughs> I am here. And so uh, on, the, on the previous slide, it has my email address. If there, you know, people have specific questions, comments, concerns, or things that you want brought forward, if you go to michigan.gov, you can link through to the task force. Those meetings are public. Those meetings are also recorded. So they are available to the public. You can participate as an uh, attendee or a viewer of those meetings. Again, I think the thing we've done well is to be transparent um, in our work and in our progress. And if you wanna, you know, you got somebody right here in Flint that's on the task force. So any questions, comments, ideas, both around our local work or our state work, you can email me at holdenc3 at msu.edu. And a lot of our other panelists are also on the local task force and um, subcommittees as well. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Deborah. You, you, thank you, you gave us such a great segue when you talked about that last item of systems care. And we're delighted today that we have three major hospital systems in our community that have all provided representation today for us to learn more about what our local hospitals are doing in the midst of this crisis. You heard us, for those of you that listened last week or you heard us on previous webinars, we talked about the change that happened when we were advised not to go to hospital because of the increasing demand on the hospitals and the emergencies related to the COVID outbreak. And so Dr. Tupper, who's here with us from Hurley Medical Center, you've seen him before. Most of us saw him out there when we had our first testing site. He came on in the midst of the, that testing happening to talk to us about what was going on. Dr. Tupper, we appreciate you being here today. Would you give us an update on what's happening at Hurley Medical Center as a, in terms of looking at the systems care and what you're doing to prepare for the patients and the staff? Dr. Tupper. Yes, Yvonne, thank you. Um, so, um, <clears throat> So that, that, that has been a concern as we deal with this pandemic is right now what we're seeing and have seen for the last several weeks to a month or so is patients that are arriving critically ill from non-COVID related conditions. So uh, late presentations of diseases like heart attacks, strokes, uh, diabetic emergencies, um, in patients that do not have COVID-19, 
um, that avoided seeking care out of the uh, a very understandable concern. Uh, one about preserving hospital resources when we when we needed it for the COVID-19 pandemic peaks, uh, and also out of um, out of fear of acquiring COVID-19 by coming to a healthcare facility. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and so. Ultimately, I wanted to discuss a few of the a few of these points with regards to what we're doing as a healthcare facility and what others are doing in healthcare environments uh, to ultimately keep our patients safe and keep them well. Um, the first thing I want to highlight is is right now, um, as as you are likely aware, uh, Michigan is one of the handful of states that does have a decreasing prevalence of COVID nineteen. And I think that reflects a lot of the hard work that uh, everyone has put in um, from our government, from our public health leaders, uh, individuals and in taking the necessary precautions um, that we are, we, are, we are a state that has uh, done what we tried to do, which is um, you know, de decrease, and decrease the curve. Uh, and so we've uh, a, a lot of a lot of hard work has been put into that. Um, right now, um, our community prevalence of COVID nineteen is decreased. Um, I we have right now in the hospital um, only a handful, a couple of active cases right now. Um, and over the past week, despite um, hundreds of tests that have run, I think we've had only two or three new infections that have been positive. So um, the, uh, the, the prevalence of the disease has, has decreased significantly. Uh, that does not mean we can let our guard down. Um, we know from experience that this disease can spread uh, rapidly um, as it did back in February and March um, when these measures were not in place. And especially as we reopen, uh, everyone needs to be cautious and um, practice uh, the things that you've talked about, the, uh, the hand hygiene, the social and physical distancing, um, and also the identification of cases so that contract tracing can be performed. Um, good sanitation, wiping down commonly used surfaces. Um, we and 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 the other piece I will touch on in, in detail is is the is the masking. Um, so uh, as as we reopen, we need to be cautious. I think there is what you've heard in sort of the media is kind of looking at things in sort of two week increments to look at whether lessening of public interventions results in um, in a surge in cases over two weeks periods. But I think what we're seeing now in places like Texas and Florida is really it's a little more delayed in that and, and the laxing of restrictions um, as they have surges in cases, it may delay more than a couple of weeks. It may be three, four weeks, five, six weeks before you start to see the effects as far as widespread, widespread transmission if social distancing measures are, um, are laxed or abandoned. Um, with, re with regards to healthcare settings, I want to hit on a few things of what we're doing to decrease the spread of COVID-19. Um, and in healthcare environments, and I think this is here to stay, probably even potentially beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, is, is, is we have universal masking. So everyone coming into the facility, um, all patients, all visitors, uh, all providers are in a mask while um, while uh, in, in the facility. Um, and that is for a number of reasons. Um, there's studies that demonstrate that the uh, rate of droplet shed in patients that have COVID-19 that are wearing a surgical face mask is decreased by 75%. So significant mitigation effects by wearing a face mask. Uh, when providers are in face masks, when patients are in face masks and all visitors are in face masks, we can significantly mitigate that spread. Um, and it's also important for decreasing the spread of other uh, illnesses I think we'll find that are, that are communicated by the respiratory route. So uh, universal masking um, 
uh, is uh, is enforced in the medical center. Um, all patients coming in are given a mask on entree. All visitors are given a mask, and obviously the healthcare um, providers are wearing masks in the facility, um, except in situations like this where I'm in my office with a closed door. Um, other things that are that are happening and from an infection control perspective is 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 what you'll note is all 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 patients, all visitors, all healthcare workers and employees are screened on entry to the facility to evaluate for any COVID-19 symptoms. And if uh, if a healthcare worker comes into work and reports COVID-19, they're immediately taken off and and ultimately reverted, uh, diverted to our occupational health um, where they're where they are tested for COVID-19. Um, same is true for patients in that anyone that we are seeing, whether it's in an outpatient clinic, um, in the emergency department that's in the hospital that develops any sorts of symptoms for COVID-19, uh, they're being uh, immediately isolated and tested um, so that we can appropriately cohort patients um, and keep anyone with potentially infectious symptoms away from other patients. Um, the other things that are taking place is any patients that test positive for COVID-19 in the healthcare setting are being sent to designated units. Um, and just with the decreased prevalence of the disease, we are now down to only one of those units. Um, when previously, when things were peaking in March and April, uh, we had entire designated floors uh, to take care of COVID patients. Um, obviously, all things are being cleaned, sterilized. Uh, any, any rooms that are turned over are cleared out with a Xenix machine that is basically a fancy sterilization UV light to, to clean out those rooms. Um, and this sort of leads me to the next piece, which is testing. Um, we, what, what's different now, but that we didn't have back in March and April when this was started is we have widespread testing capability. So we are able to run the COVID-19 test for our patients um, at Hurley in our own labs. Um, we ultimately batch most of those tests so that they're run five or six times a day but it used to be a matter where we were sending our tests to a lab in the state of Michigan um, where there was limited testing capacity. So it could take in some cases two, three, four, five, even longer days to get test results um, or not even a short while ago before we had our in-house testing capability, we're sending them to private labs where we're still looking at a day, two days, three days turnaround time. Uh, we're now running all these tests in-house. So we will have a result within several hours, um, which gives us great capabilities with regards to sorting out and identifying patients. Um, we are also able to uh, offer widespread testing and then anyone that has symptoms of COVID-19 is tested. Uh, if they present to our clinics, if they present to the emergency department, if they present in the hospital, they're being tested. Also patients uh, that are asymptomatic, um, that don't have any symptoms concerning for COVID-19 are being tested in certain environments. Um, they're, if they're requiring a surgery, a procedure, if they're being admitted into certain units in the hospital, uh, they're being tested. We're not testing every patient that's in the hospital simply because there's certain environments where it doesn't make sense, like the newborn nursery, for example. Um, but uh, of our patients admitted to the hospital, uh, right now about 80 to 90% are tested so that we know which patients are positive, which are negative, so that we can appropriately keep the COVID-19 patients isolated. Um, the last piece I wanted to touch on um, is, uh, and, and I think this also contributed to um, patients certainly not wanting to come to a hospital is visitors were restricted. Uh, whether you had 
COVID-19 or something else during the peak of the pandemic in order to minimize the spread of the infection. Uh, if you were an adult patient coming to the hospital, uh, oftentimes you would have to be dropped off by your loved ones. And then it would be your only routes of communication were, um, were phone calls and FaceTime uh, because visitors simply weren't allowed um, in, uh, in the hospital. And, and as the prevalence of the disease decreases, uh, our visitor policies are becoming more and more open. Um, that still not back to still not back to normal, but uh, such that adult patients are allowed a adult visitor um, that's designated throughout their hospital stay. So uh, when you come to the hospital, um, you, you can designate an adult visitor that can be with you, uh, that can visit in the hospital. Uh, for pediatrics, obviously, it's it's uh, it's two visitors. Um, we still have some limitations on the visitation policy just to further mitigate the spread of COVID-19. If the patient does indeed test positive for COVID-19, visitors are not allowed except in some very extenuating circumstances. But um, the, the fact that you can come to the hospital, uh, still have visitors now with your loved ones, uh, I think does eliminate some barriers to seeking treatment as well. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Tupper. And so just based upon what you're saying, particularly as it relates to the visitor policy, it, it would be good then for any family member to just to call and make sure they understand what those policies are so that they can follow it properly. And so we thank you for that today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And as you can tell, we're gonna we're allowing a little bit more time because this the, for the hospitals to present because this is just critical information. And so for those of you that have questions, we will get to those questions shortly. But we do want to hear uh, from each of the hospitals. Dr. James Williams from so I want you to stay with us now because we, we're seeing your questions. Dr. James Williams from the Claren uh, system. Would you uh, tell us now, I know there's some similarities between hospitals, but there are also some nuances. So tell us what's happening at McLaren. Well, thank you, Yvonne. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think I, I you know, I have to reiterate everything that Dr. Uh, Dr. Tupper said. Um, you know, he, you know, he described uh, pretty much all of the uh, all of the activities that hospitals across the country are are trying to make sure that that we keep patients safe as we try to return to some normal normalcy um, now in the in in what I call the kind of the peri-COVID period where uh, you know it has not disappeared yet; it is still there. And I think. Um, both you, you and and uh, and Dr. Tupper made an important um, distinction in the very beginning that we still need to make sure that we focus on staying safe. Uh, although you know, in Michigan has done a great job in implementing uh, activities to really reduce the transmission uh, of this uh, of COVID-19, uh, we have to still stay vigilant uh, and continue to make sure that we are practicing appropriate uh, social distancing and 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 face protection and meticulous hand hand uh, washing and, and cleansing. Um, McLaren, uh, like many places, um, you know, saw the the peak of our COVID uh, patients in uh, in mid to early April, uh, and then a slow decrease uh, to the point where now we are only seeing less than a handful of, of positive patients at, at any given time, um, less than ten in the hospital cur currently. Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we have changed. Um, uh, our preparation uh, to be prepared for um, those patients and the care of, of those patients. You know, we told folks for a long time, uh, try not to not to 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 go to the to the emergency department or the hospital uh, to preserve some of the equipment needed for the care of these patients. Um, and unfortunately, the the, the what happened there, uh, the uh, unintended consequences was to see folks starting to put off what we call time sensitive care, think care, things that they really should uh, be seeking their their care provider for. Uh, and over the last couple of weeks, we're starting to see more critical patients that are that are presenting at our emergency department because they have waited uh, in order to seek care, more emergency surgeries, complications from delaying uh, earlier interventions, um, and late late diagnoses of of uh, 
of, of, of those diseases that we needed to get more early uh, contact with. So, you know, at, at the hospital, we are making sure uh, that our staff continue to keep not only themselves, but every patient and every visitor safe. Uh, we continue to drill to make sure that we are using our personal protective equipment correctly each and every time. Um, I have folks that are dedicated to just making sure that our staff have the equipment and are prepared to use that equipment to keep everyone, everyone safe. Um, we have continued to follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, and as of course, as we've learned over the last couple of weeks, those recommendations change and we try to in, in, implement them as, as quickly as possible. Uh, we try to keep folks entering our building uh, in, in, in just a few areas, employees and physicians entering through one entrance and patients and visitors enter, entering into another. Uh, all of those of course are screened for any for any current symptoms uh, of, of COVID-19. Uh, just as, as Hurley continues to do, we are separating patients that have, an, uh, that, that have signs and symptoms of, of COVID um, or, and or come back with laboratory confirmation of COVID. Um, and that staff that cares for those patients are, are dedicated to those patients. Uh, and uh, they are very skilled now after doing this for, for many weeks on caring for those patients and making sure that we are not transmitting COVID to anyone else and, and or their colleagues. Uh, we continue to support social distancing in the hospital as we reopen uh, to all of our elective procedures uh, and, and making sure that our waiting areas are, are set up so that you know, chairs are at least six feet apart. Um, but when a patient is with a loved one that they have the ability then to also sit with that patient. Uh, as most facilities have done, you know, we are universal masking. Uh, staff are required to wear masks mm -hmm. and anyone in our mm -hmm. building. Uh, including vendors and maintenance and, uh, and, and visitors, of course, are required to, uh, to wear masks. Mm -hmm. But just mm -hmm. like everyone struggles with keeping their mask on, you know, folks every now and then you'll see them, mm -hmm. people pull their mask down and, and, and try, to, try to get a little relief from wearing your mask for, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And therefore sometimes uh, touchable surfaces become contaminated. Uh, so we have really focused on meticulous hand washing, mm -hmm. routine visible cleaning of all touch of all visible surfaces that could be touched, uh, mm -hmm. just in case um, droplets do uh, bypass the, the mask surfaces. Uh, we continue to have some visitation limits limitations. Uh, we are restricting uh, to one adult visitor or what we call a care partner. Uh, an individual that is needed uh, to help care for that patient. Um, we ask that um, we limit social visitation to using social media. Uh, we've been using, as you are using right now, we've used the, the Zoom software quite a bit mm -hmm. to keep patients and their, and their loved ones uh, connected uh, electronically. Um, but we are, really, we, we are slowly returning some of those visitation policies allowing um, one healthy adult with, with most of our patients. Yeah. Oh. Oh, did I lose you? You did. You're back now. Okay. <laughs> You muted temporarily. You're back now. All right, I'm back now. Well, um, you know that's that's the overview from McLe from McLaren. We are um, about 90% returned to our pre pre COVID uh, volumes, uh, and um, we we continue. You know, every day uh, we huddle to make sure that we are implementing uh, safe processes to keep everyone um, uh, safe and healthy. Thank you. That's wonderful, Dr. Williams. I'm not sure. My, my Thank husband you. Host. Yes, I'm talking. Thank you. Uh, I guess we're trying to keep the noise down, but uh, without the <laughs> background noise for everybody. So we got the muting going in and out. But appreciate you, Dr. Uh, Williams, for bringing the nuances and the insights and supporting what's being done at Hurley. And now our third our hospital system that's here is Genesis. 
And it's been great getting to know some of the inner workings of what's going on at the hospital and meeting some new friends. Dr. DeSimone uh, is uh, from the, the chief medical officer at Ascension Genesis. And many of us had a history of knowing Genesis going back to St. Joe Hospital uh, to Genesis and now Ascension Genesis. So Dr. DeSimone, can you, again, just expand a little bit on what's happening in the hospital world and what you'd like us to know about the activities at Ascension Genesis? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, first of all, thank you, Yvonne, for uh, helping to arrange this. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and it is a privilege to be uh, on a panel uh, with these other gentlemen as well. Also, I want to thank uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. Tupper for saying everything I was going to say. So uh, you made my job uh, a lot easier. But it is good to know that um, there are so many similarities uh, between the three hospitals uh, in, in our city uh, in Genesee County. Um, so uh, what you may see in front of you now are, are some of the uh, areas that I was going to touch on. And, and I can actually do this rather quickly since my predecessors uh, did such a wonderful job in explaining what we are currently doing. I just wanted to step back for a second that was mentioned before about the evolution of the COVID pandemic. As noted, uh, we started seeing our first patients in March uh, and it peaked uh, somewhere around the end of the first week in April. I think all of the hospitals uh, were really kind of caught um, uh, basically unprepared as was the whole country for that matter. And there was a lot of scrambling and learning as we moved along. It seemed like every day uh, something changed and we had to backtrack and, and, and figure out how we we're going to handle that. It was quite a challenge. Uh, at uh, Ascension Genesis, we had a uh, incident command center that was uh, developed uh, that I was part of uh, uh, with uh, many of my other colleagues. But we also had, um, we had uh, twice a day calls with the Ascension uh, State um, Hospitals and they were calling uh, Ascension National. All of those procedures and protocols that we developed uh, came along that line, but it was based mostly on CDC recommendations, as was mentioned before, as well as um, the state of Michigan. In any event, um, just to let you know, um, <clears throat> because of the, uh, the rapid influx of patients, most of the patients we're seeing at a given point in time were COVID patients. Many of those patients that were non-COVID were staying home, unfortunately, but uh, you know, the good news was we, get, we did a great job telling people to stay home. The bad news uh, was is that we did a great job telling people to stay home. Uh, and, and we're dealing with that now, as was uh, earlier mentioned, uh, the, the ramifications of that. Some people call it the, uh, uh, the silent pandemic, those people that ignored their health because of fear of coming to the hospital. So we can talk about that in a moment. In any event, <clears throat> during, the, the, during the time uh, of our surge, uh, we only did emergency and very urgent surgeon, uh, surgeries. And that was because we had concerns about the infectiousness of the disease, plus preservation of precious uh, uh, personal protection equipment, PPE, better known as PPE. Uh, all of those things influenced what we were able to do and what we did not, uh, we could not do. Uh, just as uh, Hurley and McLaren, we uh, cohorted COVID patients to try to keep the infections um, uh, uh, in, in designated areas of the hospital. We even got to a point where we converted our rapid diagnostic cardiac center uh, that sees chest pains and turned that into a negative pressure area uh, so that we could properly care for our COVID patients. Um, all of that occurred uh, and, and, and uh, it was challenging as, as I'm sure it was challenging to Hurley and to McLaren as well. Uh, so we finally got to a point where we are starting emergence from this. We, uh, we changed our, our, what we call our surge team uh, into an emergence team. And we are now, uh, thank God, coming out of, um, of the shadows of this uh, terrible disease, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, and with that, uh, we, we slowly have increased the number of surgeries that we are performing. And we are now performing uh, elective surgeries and elective procedures as we ordinarily would. Uh, we've seen most of our emergency department census come back and as well as our admissions to the hospital. So I think people are developing comfort coming back here and I wanna uh, reassure people that they should feel comfortable because we are 
as the other hospitals are doing, uh, testing and being sure that uh, patients that come to the hospital, as, as sure as we can be, uh, are not carrying the virus with them. So with that, um, uh, we are screening our physicians, associates, and visitors as uh, the other hospitals are doing. We are handing out hospital uh, masks uh, for those patients and uh, reinforcing the need to be wearing those masks at, uh, uh, all the time that they're here. Uh, we too have limited uh, uh, visitors and it was very difficult, very hard for everyone that was involved not to have your loved one by your bedside when you're ill or had emergency surgery or you were a COVID patient. We did, um, I guess one of the silver linings is, is that we learned how to use technology better. Uh, and so with, with uh, iPads and, 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 and uh, cell phones, uh, we were, we were uh, uh, able to bring that technology to patients that were isolated from their families. And I think that was very helpful. Um, we talked about universal masking, no, no more to say about that. Signage, uh, Ascension, uh, National gave us a signage for the hospital, for the doors, for the halls, for the elevators, all those places that, uh, that we need to social distance, all those places that uh, require hand washing and sanitation, uh, et cetera. Uh, food preparation and delivery, we had to take out our self-serve stations. Uh, all of our uh, food handlers uh, uh, need to wear masks and gloves uh, to make sure that uh, we're doing the right thing there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, plexiglass, plexiglass barriers uh, were installed in areas where we couldn't properly social distance, such as registration desks uh, and uh, information desks and, and some waiting areas. The emergency department, as Dr. Tupper mentioned, uh, we did a, a, a split flow, as I think almost all uh, EDs uh, had to do, where we screened patients and decided where they should be uh, in, the, in the waiting areas for the emergency department, separating those that were suspected of, of possibly having COVID or exposure from those that were not. And we continue to do that. Negative pressure rooms were important. Negative pressure, uh, in a sense, sucks out those uh, viruses and germs out of that particular room uh, and makes it safer for uh, any associates that are caring for them, any visitors that might, may, might have gone there for, for any particular reason. And as I mentioned before, uh, we actually developed some negative pressure units that were structurally converted uh, to do that. We've paid much more attention to our HVAC um, uh, systems, our, our air handling and ventilation systems by uh, frequently checking them and cleaning them. Um, we are, uh, our hospital has many private rooms but has a number of semi-private rooms and we have committed ourselves uh, to doing what we can to convert those semi-private rooms into private rooms so that uh, we can keep our patients safer. Um, hospitals, our hospital clinics, our Ascension physician uh, offices, labs, physical therapy areas, uh, radiology, all have protocols that we are using for proper sanitation and proper use of uh, PPE and testing as well. So finally, we've gotten to a point where, uh, as I mentioned before, we are uh, resuming our elective uh, surgeries and procedures. Many of those patients, especially patients that are going to re require intubation uh, or general anesthesia, will be tested preoperatively. Uh, we actually uh, start the process in the uh, surgeon's office, and we ask those um, uh, patients to self-quarantine when they anticipate a surgery within seven days. We uh, perform a, a, a test uh, 72 to 48 hours prior to the actual surgery. And the day of the surgery, once again, ask the question uh, to the patient whether they've had any type of symptomatology and we take their temperature as well. So all of these are part of what we're trying to do to try to keep our patients, our associates, our physicians uh, safe. But one last thing that I would like to add and, and was touched upon is that we are now at a point where we need to let our patients know it is safe to come back to the hospitals, clinics, physicians' offices, that they should not delay uh, urgent health care or preventative measures for that matter. And, and this is especially important for our high risk patients with chronic diseases such as hypertension, cardiac disease, history of stroke, cancer, behavioral issues, and diabetes. Um, also important for our pediatric population. We have great fear that many uh, of, of our pediatric patients are not being seen in the uh, physician's offices or clinics and immunizations are not occurring. This is very, very important. And finally, social disparities uh, are known to increase 
uh, both the morbidity and mortality for people of color and certain ethnic uh, groups. For this reason, we need to pay, uh, we need to pay uh, special attention to identifying those at risk in our community, encouraging and enabling proper medical care and prevention. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. De Simone. Ah, <laughs> I'm getting better. Thanks, I, I, this, this is really exciting, and I want to thank all three of our presenters today. And I, I will say, Doctor, um, you just tapped on something that one of our partners from uh, in the HFRCC, who is also a co-director, Dr. Susan Wolfer, has a passion about when you talked about pediatrics. Uh, so she's, she's, I'm sure, just raising her hand to everything that you said. But you also spoke about the, the importance of us paying attention to dis, the disparities and the inequities, and that's something that Dr. Deborah touched on. And so we want to appreciate you bringing that forward because I think in, for us as a community to know that all of our hospitals are sensitive to this and are doing this work diligently, I know you only touched the surface of the information from each of the hospitals. So we wanna thank you and to say that there, there's more to come. There are many more particular issues that need to be addressed. So I wanna remind us that there, there are question opportunities. I have a question that I wanna to pose to you uh, before we uh, move on, but to say we're building, you know, we're in an automotive town. So we're kind of building the car as we drive it. And so there, are, you, you mentioned changing recommendations. So we have a sensitivity that things are changing but we appreciate you helping us understand how that happens. So one of the questions had to do with individuals who are who have tested positive and, and, and we're gonna talk about testing in a moment. So that's why this is so important. I know the question has been answered, but I think for all of us to know that even though sometimes people test positive, they, there may be some, some residual, it may take a, a little while. So. Should people continue to work or be isolated during these, these uh, areas where they've tested positively? Who wants to take that? I guess I can, I can start the conversation. I think there's controversy there, quite frankly. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and again, as you pointed out, Yvonne, uh, there, this has changed so rapidly and, and literally does change from day to day. And the information just keeps coming and coming and coming. And what we thought was um, uh, was uh, gospel uh, a month ago or a week ago uh, suddenly is no longer accurate, uh, and 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 I think this is one of those gray areas that are that's very difficult. We know that, for instance, um, testing varies. Some testing is more sensitive than other testing. Uh, you may test negative, and you may get another test uh, several days later that is more sensitive, and you test positive. So no one, you know, really has a full grasp on this. I would say that uh, from what I have read, um, most people um, uh, are, are uh, not infectious somewhere between four to six to eight weeks uh, after um, uh, testing um, uh, positive for the virus. And so I think, it, I think it's, some of it is a clinical decision as to whether or not the patient's symptoms have completely abated. Uh, and, and some of it is a, a timing uh, situation and understanding the type of testing that's been performed. I'd like to hear what my other colleagues have to say about that. Yeah, this, this is a situation, and again, there's so much new, so much, um, so much emerging um, and, and so much we still don't know, although what we know now seems so much more than what we knew a couple months ago. But this is a, this is a situation where we would often um, would uh, lean um, on our infectious disease experts as well. Um, at, but there are people out there um, that test persistently positive going on 45, 50, 60 days. The current thought is, is that these individuals at these time frames have a low probability of being contagious. Um, no one can really say for certain at this point, but the prevailing thought is there is a low chance that they are that they are contagious. Um, uh, and and certainly if they are are uh, cer certainly if they are asymptomatic, um, uh, the the low probability. If if they're having if they're having symptoms, they need to be maintained on on any isolation um, uh, until until they are totally asymptomatic. But those are the sorts of decisions that we're making case by case clinical determinations um, in consultation with 
um, our infectious disease experts. Thank you. Uh, Dr. James, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I think we're pretty much on the on the same page there, and, and you know, at, at we 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 look at we look at the, the evidence on an ongoing basis, and unfortunately, sometimes it's quite conflicting. Um, you know, we try to we try to with our own employees, we try to limit their their return to work um, uh, at, at least until at least for ten days after their initial symptoms, and 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 no sooner than 72, 72 hours after their symptoms that they've been totally symptom free, but our but of course, our employee health folks screen every every employee before they come back to determine for that particular employee does it make sense for them to come back. Okay. I think I the do, other I, thing, if I could just add one more thing, Yvonne, and sure. that is, because you have a positive test, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are infectious at that point because many of these tests test for um, dead virus as well, and so uh, you know unless you were able to take that test and culture. Uh, the virus and grow it, you really wouldn't know for sure. Thank you. I know that there are many, many more questions about the whole issue around testing, how often and so forth. And there are some CDC recommendations. But I do want to ask, uh, and thank you again, all three of you, Dr. Tupper, Dr. Williams, and Dr. DeSimone, we thank you so much. And we'll look forward to having you uh, participate with us again in future webinar. Uh, the, the, the testing is often an issue how often, and so we have with us a faithful team member here, Susan, Suzanne Cooper from the Genesee County Health Department. She's gonna give us an update on what's going on locally as far as test opportunities, because as you're saying, there, me, there is a need for multiple testing. And so Suzanne, can you give us the update on what's happening here locally? Suzanne, can you unmute yourself? She's out in the field, but she's here. Suzanne? Yes, she's unmuted. She's unmuted. Okay. Uh, well, as you can see, while she's getting to us, you can see that we have several test sites here in our local community. Uh, and she'll she'll chime in here in a moment. But Kroger is, is, is now providing the test services at my community college. And many of us have heard this, that they're going to be there, Kroger will be at Mott Community College until June 30th. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that you were aware that there will be testing at this site beyond June 30th. It'll just be handled by another provider. And so uh, in addition to that, there are other sites that are being worked on or being investigated right now for additional community testing sites. Uh, the list here shows Rite Aid is still in operation. Rite Aid will be continuing and they made Yvonne, special provision. Yeah, there you are. All right. I got kicked out of the meeting. Wow. So Good just diligence in coming back. So just a reminder to everyone that there is testing available in our community. There are a large number of locations that are available. Michigan Health Specialist is still doing testing at two locations, one in Flint and one in Burton by appointment. We have Hamilton Community Health Network Clinic providing testing at their North Point Clinic and at the fire station at the corner of South Saginaw and Bristol Road. We have the Rite Aid in Swartz Creek and the Rite Aid on, on Clio Road in Flint. Uh, you can make an appointment for those two locations through the Rite Aid website. And we also have Walmart available on Corona Road, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 7 a.m. until 9 a.m you make the appointment through the Quest website. We also have Mott Community College, which is a drive you through site right now, available Wednesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 through June the 30th. And then after June the 30th, this location will be one of the moonshot sites that are going to be operated by the state of Michigan. So we do know that we have three additional sites besides the Mott Community College site that will be coming up shortly. And we do not have specific details of the dates yet, but we know that Word of Life, Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church, and Beecher High School will be those additional locations. And we'll be providing you some additional information about those sites as it becomes available. Thank you, Suzanne, we appreciate it. And that these updates are so critically important. I just do wanna reemphasize 
to our community members when we hear that there is a need for testing. These sites are available. We want to, those of you particularly who are outreach workers, navigators, community health workers, please help us let the community know about these sites because the more we utilize them, that, that demand we know is there, but sometimes people have concerns about them and you can help us alleviate those concerns as well as uh, sharing the information that we've received here today. We appreciate your questions. So we ask you in the next few moments to continue asking those questions. Wanna just touch uh, base right now with Gary Jones. Is there a quick update from the governor's office? Well, I can't say quick. Um, <laughs> give us so, that. Give us that that thumbnail version. <laughs> all right. What I what I will say, just to, uh, for brevity and time's sake, um, if anybody wants, um, this is you know, there's obviously been a lot going on, um, and, you know, inside of the uh, the governor's office. Um, I don't know if you have the screen, Yvonne, that has like my contact information, but um, if people have been seeing anything lately um, in the press. And if they have like any specific questions, what I can do is make sure that they get on my email list. Um, and that's sort of like one of the best tools that I have just to keep folks updated uh, with things that, that are so rapidly changing uh, on a daily basis. Uh, but if the screen is not available, I can just give it out verbally. Uh, my email. Would you, would you do that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Email is uh, jonesg9 at michigan.gov. So that's J-O-N-E-S, the letter G, the number nine. And Michigan is spelled out completely at michigan.gov. Thank you, Gary. I know there's a, there's so much because you're giving us those updates every day, sometimes two or three times a day. So it is, if they can get on your, your, your email list, that would be absolutely wonderful. I see Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, a city update. Where are we with your words of, of, of encouragement from the health chief health officer at the city of Flint? Well, thank you. Uh, call me the health advisor to the mayor. Health advisor and, to the mayor. Got yes. it. I'm a chief with, with no followers. Uh, <laughs> but speaking to my friends and neighbors, June 10th, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services issued these new guidelines and messaging for who should be tested. If you feel sick, get tested. If someone close to you feels sick, get tested. If you work outside the home, get tested. And testing is not a one and done thing because some of us work in occupations where we have constant contact with the public. Uh, even though we're wearing masks and following precautions, some of us also work in uh, group homes, uh, in prisons, jails, uh, extended care facilities, uh, food processing, uh, agricultural work. So. There are specific guidelines for when you need to be retested. So if you're negative on your first test, you thank God. But if you're working in certain industries and certain jobs and certain locations, uh, you may have to get retested. So you should see your employer. And if your employer doesn't know, you can call the county health department or MDHHS. Michigan. Flint, Michigan is in a medium risk area. And so there are specific guidelines for testing in this area, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So uh, you can get this information and I, I'm sure uh, Brother Jones from the state will be able to get that communication to you. It's difficult to go through. Uh, so if you have questions, you should ask your physician or your employer for the specifics. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. And I, you, you mentioned that testing again, we just cannot reemphasize that enough. I think our hospitals have given us clear indication that they're consistently testing as people come in, but we also need to do the testing in community. I wanna remind you today is a special day. It is Juneteenth. It is remembrance and recognition and celebration. So for those of us that are going to go out and celebrate, let's be, be, be mindful that we still need to protect ourselves, utilize those universal precautions by space and social distancing, physical distancing, and, and washing our hands. We want to remind you again, if you would complete the, the, the pop-up evaluation, your questions and comments are so important. So if you've still got one you want to put in, our panelists will be here a couple of minutes after the webinar closes to respond to any of your questions. Always feel free to email us 
at hfrcc.org for additional information to get more details and utilize the information from the previous week's webinars. There is much more information we'd love to share with you as a community. We need you also to help us. Please reach out, share the webinar information with others. You can like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And again, if you need more information or have questions, feel free to send us those questions. Thank you again to all of our panelists today that have been so helpful. We appreciate you and want you to know that the information you share will help us as a community make informed decisions. So all of you that have listened today and participated, we thank you. We look forward to seeing you and talking with you next week with more pertinent information around this issue. Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center certainly appreciates the input that you provide for us. Again, let me say thank you and we'll look forward to you being with us again next week.